Hello, this is Eric Topol, Editor-in-Chief of Medscape, and I'm really delighted to have the chance to speak with uh, Dr. Judy Melanick, who is a forensic pathologist up in Northern California. Uh, she has a remarkable background at Harvard uh, College, UCLA, in med school, and she's been on the faculty at UCSF and now is associated with UC Davis and the Alameda uh, Sheriff's uh, Department. So uh, it's been a very interesting week, uh, Judy, and maybe- <laughs> Tell me about off, it, yeah. <laughs> maybe we can start off with uh, October 30th, the Annals yeah. Internal Medicine publishes their public policy on yeah. guns and firearms. Exactly. A very rational paper. Every word of it is there. Now, you um, are, of course, active on social media, Twitter, yes. and you posted something. Uh, how did you get onto this? The, 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 what happened was is that the Annals of Internal Medicine uh, rep presenting the position paper of the American College of Physicians came out with guidelines for internal medicine practitioners about gun safety. And it turned out that the NRA had gotten a hold of this and had tweeted out something along the lines of, self, somebody should tell self-important doctors to stay in their lane when it comes to gun control. And I wasn't the only one. There were multiple doctors on social media and other healthcare professionals, including psychiatrists, psychologists, um, uh, nurses, uh, physical therapists, chiropractic physicians, they all fought back saying, this is our lane. In fact, hashtag this is our lane or this is my lane started trending. And I had woken up on Friday morning and I had seen the NBC article the day before, but I hadn't commented on it. And on Friday morning, I was going into work at the coroner's office. I had three cases, one of which was a gunshot wound case. It was my second case that week of gunshot wound death. The first one had been a homicide just a few days earlier. And I just lost it. <laughs> I mean, I know they say don't tweet angry, but I tweeted angry. Um, I wrote, I'm trying to remember my, my exact quote. It was something along the lines of, do you know how many bullets I recover from cadavers weekly? Or so I, say, I think corpses weekly, I said. Um, this isn't just my lane. This is my effing highway. And I went, you know, shut off my phone, went in the morgue. And then four hours later when I got out, I found out that it had gone viral. Oh, did it ever. You know, I don't yeah. know. I, I've been on uh, Twitter for nine years and I've never seen a tweet that has <laughs> 900,000, whatever. God. Just unbelievable. Yeah. But, but what was unbelievable to me was how generally positive it was. I mean, the thing is, is I got so many uh, retweets and comments from people in medicine and in healthcare in general. Uh, I got uh, reactions from a lot of victims of gun violence, uh, survivors, and they were all, you know, saying, you go, girl, and what, did you encouraging get any, me. Yeah. Did you get yeah. any hostile responses? In general, I got mostly positive responses, even from the people who disagreed with me, they were disagreeing respectfully. I was a little concerned that there may be some trolls or um, some activists who would potentially be threatening. Um, there was only one kind of veiled threat along the lines of, you should be a cop so you can get shot. And I reported mm -hmm. that to Twitter and to their credit, they took it down in about 30 minutes. So wow. um, that was really encouraging to me. I, you know, I think the bottom line is that a lot of responsible gun owners and NRA members actually agree with doctors that we need to do something. They don't necessarily agree with the NRA, even though they're members of the organization. Um, you know, they're, the NRA still, saw, you know, they've been silent ever since this tweet storm. And I think that that says something. Uh, one thing I've been pointing out is that the NRA, you know, at its inception when it was developed was actually a gun safety organization and was designed to train people how to use guns safely. And at some point they kind of lost their vision and their mission. And I, I, I think that we can, you know, as responsible uh, physicians, um, even, and, and especially physicians who are gun owners or NRA members have a special responsibility to speak up and get the leadership to start coming in a direction where we can all come to agreements about certain things. You know, we, there should be a way, there should be a balance where we can respect people's second amendment rights to own weapons, even individually, not just as a militia, but still keep our patients safe which means that when people are having a mental health crisis or are depressed 
or have exhibited suicidal or homicidal ideations, have reached out or have easy access to weapons and are starting to build an armamentarium, um, that other people should be able to step in and use legal mechanisms such as ERPOs, extreme risk protection orders, to step in and keep them and other people safe. Yeah, no, no question. Well, I want to applaud you, you, you among others, but you certainly attracted the most attention of all the views <laughs> stood up. It's really important that you yeah. did that. Now, one of the things I want to touch on before, uh, but before we do that, that is activism among physicians. That's a big yes. topic. But before we get to that, I want to just drill down a little bit on the gun story. So sure. there's about 400 million guns in the U.S. Yeah. for 325 million people. And we have uh, over 12,600 deaths uh, this year already. You know, the year's not even done. 50,000 uh, gun-related incidents, over 300 mass shootings this year. Yep. And we have the plurality of Americans wanting yep. gun control. So yes. th th what, what's holding us back is in part this NRA, right? I mean, they basically lobby hard to not have any controls as we've seen. So even though it's been light that is taking on the NRA about their tweet, the ridiculous tweet about the mm -hmm. self-absorbed, uh, whatever. Right. Of self. Well, but, but we don't, we don't even yeah. take on enough, right? I mean. I, I think that we have a responsibility as physicians to step up and make a statement. I mean, medical organizations, whether it's the American Medical Association, the, um, American College of Physicians, and apparently the American College of Surgeons just came out with a statement as well, which was authored by uh, 22 surgeons. I believe 19 of them are gun owners themselves. So we have a responsibility as physicians to speak out on behalf of our patients. And this is no different than speaking out about the dangers of alcohol in pregnancy or the dangers of certain toys. We, I mean, physicians have been trained and we know that if we see something that's dangerous for the pediatric population, a toy that breaks apart or is a choking hazard, we report it to the Consumer Product Safety Commission and it gets recalled because it's a, it's a hazard. So we have a track record as physicians of speaking up on behalf of our patients when something is dangerous. And especially when we're dealing with guns, there are ways to make them safer. Trigger, trigger locks can make them safer. Um, even limiting access to some degree, especially for people who have mental illness or have uh, been you know, showing themselves to have violent tendencies. We have a capacity oh, to yeah. step in and regulate it. And that's, yes, and well, that's the other thing. High velocity rifles, these are weapons of war. They cause a lot more tissue destruction than handguns. That's not to say you can't kill people with handguns either, but the bottom line is the surgeons that I've spoken to, the autopsies I've performed in high velocity rifle rounds cause a lot more tissue damage and they're less recoverable. They cause a lot more um, morbidity in the survivors. So we can do legislation. We can pass legislation that's bipartisan that most of the country is going to be behind. And the only obstacle in our path right now is the NRA. And I'll be honest with you. I think that they will come to the table. I think that they will come to the table for two reasons. For two reasons. My op I'm optimistic. And I'm optimistic for, the for these two reasons. Reason number one is because they recognize that a big chunk of their own gun owners understand the power of the weapons themselves and know that they're dangerous. I have spoken to law enforcement agents. I've spoken to doctors who are responsible gun owners. And they all say, you know, I'm not like that. <laughs> I, you know, I think that what the NRA has done is going too far. And they're sometimes afraid to speak out because they're in a culture where guns are much more acceptable and they're afraid that there's going to be political backlash or that some of their patients who are gun owners might disagree with them and they don't want to put obstacles between them and their patients. But there are many responsible gun owners who are NRA members and who do not think the organization, at least politically, is adequately representing them. They want to see restrictions as well. So that's one reason why I think they're going to come to the table. The other reason why I think they're going to come to the table is that especially if we put money into research and development of new state-of-the-art weapons, ones that have trigger locks that can only, for example, be operated by the person who purchased it. And if it's stolen, it doesn't work. 
I mean, why, why is it, the example I give is that, why is it with my iPhone, I, have, I can unlock it with my fingerprint and nobody else can get in there without that fingerprint. And if I lose it, it's got a GPS attached to it. I could trace it anywhere in the United States just by find my iPhone. And yet we don't have this technology in guns. Right. Though that would allow a weapon to not only be state of the art, so you can manufacture something really cool that everybody's gonna wanna buy, but if we replace what's currently out there in the marketplace, number one, a police officer or even a lawful gun owner is never going to be afraid that the gun is gonna be taken away from them and used against them. That would make the weapon more safe. Yeah, and then no, if it is stolen, you can track it. Right, those are great ideas and I, I love your optimism. We need some optimism, but let me yeah. just say, uh, Judy, if you look back at what's happened this year from the Parkland shooting yes. with, uh, to the Pittsburgh synagogue, yes. you see that this is relentless. Mm -hmm. And in each time, each time this happens, you, you hear these ridiculous statements about, oh, we should have had a, 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 an armed uh, person in the synagogue or, we, or the school or whatever. Yeah. These are ridiculous. And this is in part supported by NRA, right? It is. And you know, it's only when you actually come from a country where there are armed guards anywhere do you have a perception of what that's like. I was originally born in Israel. My family lives there. Um, clearly, it's a very different environment with regards to uh, existential threats from enemies. And there's been wars there as opposed to on our own soil here in the United States. But you cannot go into a mall in Israel without getting your bag checked. Um, you can't uh, go any place really where there's public gathering without very heightened security. And even there, the security is carrying guns, but terrorism happens mm. and it, it can't be stopped exclusively just by people having guns. It happens and it maybe gets shut down a little bit faster, but the criminals can have guns and everybody else has guns. And then there's crossfire and there's other ways that people can, um, deal with that. It's not, you know, I, I, I love Israel, but I don't want to live in a society like that. That's one of the reasons why my parents emigrated to the United States. My father was in a war. He had PTSD. Um, he was a victim of gun violence. He broke both his legs um, in a war. So mm -hmm. it's important to me to see the United States go on a different path. And I would rather live in a society where we don't have to worry when we go to the movie theater. I would rather live in a society where my kids don't have active shooter drills at their school. I mean, this is not how I want them raised. I want them to live in peace. Right, and, and I think we have an outlier country. There's no country that has guns at this magnitude uh, you know, for the population, and it's just something has to be done. So now let me get into a couple of related topics. You've been very active on Twitter <laughs> and uh, I think not just this week, but of course, before. in the past, yeah. What, what, what do you, of course, there's a minority of physicians who are on Twitter. Right. What, what, what do you get out of it? Why do you like to use it? Well, my exposure to Twitter initially came when my husband and I uh, published a book four years ago. It's called Working Stiff, Two Years, 262 Bodies and the Making of a Medical Examiner. It's a memoir about my forensic pathology training in New York City from 2001 to 2003. So I had kept a diary during my fellowship. And then at the end of the fellowship, I handed it to my husband, TJ, who's a writer, and said, hey, you're the English major, do something with this. And we uh, published it together and it came out uh, four years ago and it became a New York Times bestseller. So at the time, I had to learn <laughs> how to uh, respond to uh, readers, how to engage with uh, those who had uh, been inspired by the book and Twitter and Facebook social media, both those social media platforms became a way for me to uh, talk about forensics, talk about things that I was really interested in and um, share information about our writing, promote our writing. So we also, in addition to uh, working stiff, uh, I write a column for Forensic Magazine. Um, I write um, a column for MedPage Today. So I have that platform and that's why I became comfortable with it. By using the platform, I actually realized from a medical perspective, it is fantastic at spreading public health messages. Yeah. So just that, even that term going viral, which is an epidemiological term, <laughs> um, is relevant because now we have an opportunity when we have a public health message, whether it's get your flu shot, 
or um, get your kids vaccinated, or in this case, let's talk about gun safety, we can really spread it to millions of people in real time very, very quickly. That is a really powerful force. So I do encourage people to use Twitter. I completely understand those who are averse to social media because you are putting yourself out there publicly. And yes, there are um, people out there who are trolls and you know, will try to dox you and things like that. Um, but in, I think that the good outweighs the bad um, with regards to spreading public health messages and saying, um, get, getting information out to our patients in, a, in real time. Uh, I totally agree with you. I think that you have shown the power of uh, social yeah. media and Twitter, uh, certainly, in recent days. Yeah. Now, the other topic I wanted to get your views about, uh, you know, mostly over the years, physicians have been reluctant to be activists. And you, yeah. basically, we, I yeah. say we, we kind of um, lay down and play dead. You know, <laughs> we don't. I, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually counteract you. I yeah. think that we're individual physicians are afraid to go out there, and part of it has to do with the fact that um, we, 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 we are steeped and educated in a culture of privacy. When we are one-on-one -on -one with our patients, we develop a rapport. Everything that we say is private. It's protected <laughs> by law. And so we develop that sense of intimacy and we don't want to violate that. So that's definitely a component of the culture of being a physician. Right. But as groups, physicians have actually come together and been very active. Um, if you look at how physicians came together and did the research and pressured legislation with regards to the auto industry many years ago, it was physicians who spearheaded and insisted that there be safety restraints in cars, that there, that children, that infants be put in car seats, um, that labels be put on cigarettes, um, that cigarettes shouldn't be used in indoor spaces and in hospitals. Remember, remember back in the day, I mean, you might even remember back in the day when doctors were smoking in the hospital out. Well, they, they were part of the ads for, for right. some, yeah. Exactly. I think that we have a history of activism when we get pushed and when we really see a public health crisis. Well, um, I, I agree. In fact, and this that, is it. that may be the best thing uh, that the NRA has ever done, which is to, to put out this tweet. <laughs> That's angry. It's well, the only good thing they've ever done. But what yeah. I wanted to say is that we have had a lot of things done in the medical community where there was basically no reaction. You know, like, for example, you know, the whole uh, electronic health record fiasco. Oh, God. Well, or relative value. <laughs> Don't unit. get me started on electronic yeah. health. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, there's so many things, Judy, that we have yeah. just lived through, you know, in yeah. our times where we didn't stand up for patients, you know. Right. And you're bringing up some great examples where that did occur. We but did, you know, yeah. oftentimes it took decades, like for it cigarettes does. and tobacco, from the moment it was recognized a link to cancer and heart disease right. to the time when doctors actually finally stood up. Because oftentimes, besides the point you raised about you know, having your head down, taking care of patients. It's being busy. And also, yes. you know, that's not in the natural, it's not in the natural um, uh, decorum of physicians. You don't see many are running for political office. You don't see many that are, you know, in the public uh, eye. Well, yes, I know. I mean, there are physicians, you know, who are politicians as well. And yes. a member, we have members of Congress and, and in the House of Representatives who are former physicians. Sure. Um, but definitely the careers are mutually exclusionary in many ways. I mean, you can't be running your private practice and still be uh, politically active simultaneously. Um, just because of time restrictions. I mean, ultimately, as physicians, if you have uh, a, a practice, even, you know, even a part-time practice, it does uh, eat up a lot of your personal time, and you, want, you do want time for your family. So I, I totally understand that. Right, right. Um, th that said, the fact that you can have, uh, you know, a megaphone basically at your fingertips with social media, that, that was what blew my mind about the tweet going viral is that, I all you know I, I thought I had a phone and it turned out to be a megaphone, <laughs> and so it was, it was. It's incredibly powerful, and so a lot of physicians have joined Twitter in particular because it's quick. Because you know the tweets are very small, and you can be engaged in you know usually downtime when you're standing around doing nothing uh, online. You know the, those those periods of times where we used to just you know, be bored. Uh, you can be a lot more engaged, and you can reach out to millions of people very quickly. Well, that's what I wanted to underscore. And you are, to me, the exemplar, okay? Because you 
reached millions, perhaps <laughs> millions of people. And then yeah. you know, one thing led to another. Then you're on with Chris, uh, Christina Amanpour and all these other things that you did. Yeah. And it all started with a tweet. It so all did, yeah. What I'm hoping is that uh, I uh, think activism is something that uh, so important. You, it is important. You have shown uh, the power of communication through this uh, medium of Twitter, uh, what it can lead to, and all the good things. You know, I think obviously many other physicians did uh, get engaged, but none oh, yeah. had the same response as you. Uh, well, I, th I think being foul mouth sometimes helps too. But, you know, like I'm embarrassed because, of course, my kids who are teenagers, and I'm the one who's telling them don't use foul language, and then they see this. But at the same time, you know, they're the ones doing active shooter drills in their school. So they understand why I'm passionate about it. And yeah. they understand why I spoke out. Well, I, I can't thank you enough on behalf of thank you. not just the medical community, uh, the Medscape community, I'm sure you're going to hear a lot from yeah. your fellow physicians uh, uh, who are uh, as part of this audience. That's great. Thank you and for, for being, uh, you know, representing us because we don't have enough of that. And I hope that uh, your optimism, I hope it'll play out like like you say, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I hope so too. We've got a new Congress now. You know, they just we just finished an election, so I'm hopeful about that as well. I do want to encourage Medscape physicians and people who are listening to this, even if they're not active on social media, um, be aware of the gun control debate in your state and even nationally. And when we do come out with bills or when Congress comes out with bills, please make your voice heard. Call your congressman, email them. Nowadays, you can go on their website and you can contact them and let them know that you're a physician. And if you're a gun owner, let them know you're a gun owner. Let them know you're an NRA member so that they realize that they have your support. Because really, this isn't about restricting the Second Amendment. What this is about is making sure that dangerous people, um, people who are at risk for harming others or themselves, don't have easy access. Well, Judy, you are a, a veritable gem. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us in Medscape. And uh, I'll look forward very much to following this not just the whole topic, but, yes. but you, you're really a, a born leader. So thanks very much. <laughs> thanks. I appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye.